Good evening, everyone. My name is Rob Wolsey, and I'm a member of the Guild of Battlefield Guides. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is the Battle of Hill 70, which took place in August of 1917. Affiliated with any of the companies, applications, or products that are going to be named in this presentation, and they do not sponsor, the Military Family Services is not sponsored, does not sponsor, and does not endorse any of the companies or anything like that. It's really important to, to remember that. Um, I am a battlefield guide in Europe and I do not represent MFS. What we're gonna talk about today is uh, the overview of the Battle of Hill 70. We're gonna talk about recommended preparations, visas, travel advisories, security, some helpful hints, some places that I recommend you can eat, some places you can stay, we'll talk about some transportation challenges. Uh, we'll talk about an overview of the whole battle. Uh, the main attack itself on the 15th of August, the kick phase from the 16th to the 17th, um, the consolidation phase from the 18th to the 20th of August, the attack into the city of Lens itself on the 20th and 21st, and then the final little action for the attack ending uh, the 22nd to the 25th of August. And most importantly, what where you can visit to see this battle. The picture on this slide is the Canadian artillery positions uh, in front of Hill 70 in the lead up to the bombardment. This photo is taken at the end of July 1917. You can see a very barren and blasted uh, battlefield. So we're talking about France. And specifically, we're going to be in the area around the city of Lens, uh, which is in the Haute de France in the Pas de Calais. The population in the area is about 30. And they speak French. The main airport is Paris Charles de Gaulle. It is the easiest one to get to. Um, initially, it's a fort. This town was a fortification against the Normans, and it changed over ownership over the centuries several times until it was ceded to France in 1659. It was largely destroyed in the First World War, and it's only about nine kilometers from the Vimy Ridge Memorial. France is the seventh most expensive country to live in Europe, so its prices are higher than the average. Um, as I said, it was originally a fortification against the Normans. It was raised as in 1303 by the Flemish, and in 1526 it became part of the Spanish Netherlands, only to be to return to France in 1659. And in 1849, coal was discovered, leading this to be a major industrial center in the region. So, Lens is a generally mild climate with wet, cool winters and warm, dry summers. Uh, very typical for most of Europe. It's mildly aggressive. Uh, the best time to travel in this area is from the end of April, really, to the end of October. Uh, a rain jacket is always a good idea. It helps break the wind, and you also need really good footwear. Uh, walking around some of these parks can, and areas and battlefields can be quite challenging. Flip-flops are not recommended. Uh, always have travel insurance with you and medical insurance. You never know what's going to go wrong. Uh, if you have my bad luck, I in the last two tours in the last month, I've almost parked on two artillery shells. So you definitely want what you're going to walk into. Uh, all memorials are child-friendly, and most places in the towns are very child-friendly and pet-friendly. But there are no city passes in this part of France. Uh, it's a little bit small townish for that. So it's always important to check the travel advisories for the government of Canada for traveling to France. Um, France, there's a series of COVID requirements. They've generally been lifted now that the pandemic is over. You can stay in France, like in most EU countries, for 90 days without a visa. Terrorism and petty crime are a risk, but it's generally a safe country, especially where we're going to be. It's very, really quite safe. Uh, there is a hospital in the city of Lens itself. Uh, 112, of course, is the emergency number for France, like all of Europe. And of course, the closest embassy or consulate is Paris. It's the only one in the country. So some helpful tips. Always dress for the weather. And it's close to the sea, so it can be a little bit chilly. It seems that you don't, you don't think it's going to be that far, but I had been there in the height of summer. Um, and it can be quite cool. Last time I was there, it was about 15 degrees and it was not very warm. So, and there's always a breeze. It's just the way that part of France is. Um, please don't climb on any of the monuments. That's exactly what they are. They're monuments or memorials to the fallen or to the actions that took place there. This also applies for any vehicles or weapons you see on display. They can be really dangerous. Many have been outside for many, many years or decades in some cases and can be rated without being maintained. And it's just not worth the risk. Please also remember that you're visiting people's homes and businesses. This is where they live and work. And to allow us to keep visiting, we need to respect their property and their space. And it's a real challenge sometimes uh, with people wanting to walk through battlefields and walk through farmers' fields 
something as a guide, we have to remind people that that's their livelihood. So, must try foods. The Place de Jean Jour is the central square in the city of Lens, and here you'll find several bars and restaurants. Heritage is a passionate lens, lens, and it is reflected by the many restaurants that have an air each year. And make sure that you feel that you're dining at a Chez Grand Mer. It's hearty northern cuisine. It's got dishes like phlegm and couche, which is similar to phlegm and couche, and a, uh, a pizza with a cream-based um, sauce. They make uh, a great uh, brief stew with sugars and beets. And the other thing you should try is some uh, marloi, which is a very strong and smelly cheese. It's really yummy. Um, and there's also a, a fromagerie in Lens. A Philippe Olivier one is there and is really quite spectacular. So I find the food in northern France absolutely amazing. I've never had a bad meal in anywhere in northern France. So when you go to Lens, like you would go to Arras or Dunkirk, there's just so much good food there. It's hard. One place I can recommend is uh, Cozy L'Etiquette. It's, uh, it's a wine bar that offers a menu of homemade traditional dishes, um, such as um, uh, I need a pot. I can't even pronounce that. It's a traditional dish from the area. It's really quite good. I quite enjoyed it. Best places to say. Lens has lots of hotels you can choose from, including a B&B &B hotel, which is one of the less expensive, but really quite modern, nice hotels. And there's the Hotel Lens Hotel. Another option is to choose to stay in the city of Arras, which is only about, probably about 13 or 15 kilometers away. As visiting Hill 70, 70 is either one day on a tour or part of one day of a tour, and you can easily tie it into a weekend visit to Vimy Ridge. Uh, at Arras, I would recommend staying at the Holiday Inn Express. It's the hotel that I have used the most in my time there, and it is the most convenient and has parking. So there, there are no rideshare services in Lens. Uh, it's one of the challenges of being small town France. Uh, there are many guides. Some are local, uh, but I always recommend you use a guide. Battlefield guides give you context, tell the story, and actually can give you much more detail about where you physically are at uh, when you're on the tour or touring. Uh, there are a couple of resources I would recommend. One is the Guild of Battlefield Guides. Uh, it's an excellent, that's the guild that I belong to. It's a very professional organization of guides. And uh, of course, I'm Woolsey's Warwalks. And I'm an excellent choice because I specialize in Canadian first battlefields. Uh, another really important thing about driving in Europe, uh, always have an international driver's license. A lot of countries, if you try to rent a car, you actually need one to be able to rent a car. So the Battle of Hill 70. So what we're talking about is the Canadian Corps, which when this battle is fought, Lieutenant General A.W. Curry, or Arthur Curry, is a brand new Lieutenant General, and he's just taking command of the Canadian Corps in the middle of June 1917. And the divisions involved in the fighting are the 1st Canadian Division, which General Curry had given up to command and passed to Major General Archibald McDonnell. His nickname was Batty McDonnell. He was a regular cavalry officer from Lord Strathcona's Horse. The second Canadian division was commanded by Major General Henry Burstall, who was an artillery officer and had commanded the artillery at the Second Battle of Beach and was an outstanding commander of troops. And then the last division that was in this fight was the fourth Canadian division, the least experienced of the divisions in the Corps, commanded by Major General David Watson, a newspaper man from Quebec who had started the war as a battalion commander in 1915 and had worked his way up to division command. They were facing off against the German uh, Fourth Corps under General Lieutenant Richard von Crewell uh, and his 7th Division, which was commanded by General Major Hans von der Esch. And they were in the northern part of the battlefield because the battlefield was split between the two on the German side. General de Infantry Julius Raymond and his 11th Reserve Division under General Major Friedrich Rudiger Georg von Herzenberg. So, these two divisions were, were sitting in there. So that's kind of, uh, you'll see the picture. That's the official history map on the side. It's a great map to, to see because you can see where the units were going in. And if you look at some of these spots today, those road systems are the same. The Battle of Hill 70 was fought between the 15th and the 25th of August, 1917, around the city of Lens in Northern France. At this point in the war, the French were still recovering from their disastrous Nivelle Offensive, otherwise known as the Second Battle of the Assane, from the 16th of April to the 9th of May, 1917. And this battle broke the French army and put them into near mutiny. 
The British Expeditionary Force Commander, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, ordered the British First Army, commanded by General Henry Horn, to attack towards the city of Lens to cut off a salient German salient there and shorten his front line. But General Horn was unwilling to fight in the ruins of the city because his forces were badly under strength since fighting the Battle of Arras, and his artillery was in terrible shape from all the fighting that spring. The Germans in 19, early 1917 had withdrawn to the Hindenburg Line, a series of well-built defensive lines that shortened the front line so significantly that it freed up numerous divisions. And after the Somme and Verdun, they too were in very rough shape. They fell back. And when they fell back, they had literally left the earth scorched behind them. The 9th of June, 1917, Lieutenant General Arthur Curry was promoted to that rank and commander of the Canadian Corps, replacing now promote, newly promoted General Julian Bing, who had been ordered to take over command of the British Third Army. When Lieutenant General Arthur Curry was given the task by the First Army commander, Henry Horn, he was not happy. Lens, the city, is dominated by Hill 70 to the north and the Solomines Hill to the south, which he regarded as far more tactically important than the town itself as he felt that holding the town with the Germans on the high ground, the Canadians in the ruins would be exposed in the low ground, and it was a terrible plan. He also realized he would be deploying his artillery in the open plains, easily visible, and being presented as easy targets for the Germans. Curry persuaded, persuaded General Horn to switch his objective from the city of Lens to Hill 70, and he hoped, originally, to carry out the attack on the 30th of July, 1917. His idea was that with the Canadian Corps on the hill, with an observation deep into the German lines, similar to Vimy Ridge, this would provoke the Germans to launch a massive counterattack to try to retake the hill, which he would coordinate with massive amounts of artillery fire. Little and began on the 22nd and 23rd of July, when the 3rd Canadian Division, under Major General Louis Lipset, attacked to destroy dugouts and trench mortar emplacements, and essentially became a one battalion trench trade by the 116th Infantry Battalion. They replaced a unit called the 60th Battalion, uh, which had to be disbanded that winter because it couldn't get enough men from the area it was recruited from. And despite a German gas attack as they formed up, the operation was a complete success, lasting about 35 minutes, but only cost Canada 74 casualties but they ended up taking 53 prisoners back with them. The poor weather of late 1917 forced a postponement until the middle of August, and while they waited, the Canadians limited their operations to raiding, and while the artillery carried out a steady program of wire cutting and counter-battery artillery fire. The Canadians also carried out a massive gas program, which by the 15th of August had fired 3,500 drums and 15,000 gas shells in of Lens and on Hill 70, effectively neutralizing 40 of the 102 German artillery batteries. Most people don't realize this, but Canada was a prolific user of gas warfare, especially under Arthur Curry. He liked to gas the Germans a lot. The 4th Canadian Division replaced the 3rd Canadian Corps right flank on the 26th of July. And in the reserve area, the troops of the 1st and 2nd Divisions were carrying out special training for the attack, very similar to what they had done at Vimy Ridge. While it was impossible to hide that an attack was coming, or even when it would be, Gidlins to throw off the German scent of where things might happen. Hill 70 was a treeless expanse of chalk that gave a commanding view of the Douai Plain, the opposite end of Vimy Ridge, the western slope and the northern side of the hill was steep, falling towards the village of Luce, which is the scene of the famous 1915 battle. There were many suburbs of Lens, which were in ruins, creating a maze where the trenches now meandered across the battlefield. The final objective for the Canadian Corps was a series of older German trench trenches on the lower slopes of Hill 70 and then the summit itself. The concept was that the Canadians would consolidate in the deep dugouts and trenches the Germans had built and let Hill 70 become a killing by artillery battle. The main assault was to be supported by nine field artillery brigades, five with the 1st Canadian Division and four with the 2nd Canadian Division. They would be supplemented by a machine gun barrage from 160 Vickers medium machine guns. 
The training of the divisions focused on mopping up captured areas and bringing forward 48 machine guns assigned to each of the attacking brigades as soon as their objectives were taken, with each machine gun becoming the center of a platoon strongpoint of about 30 men. The plan was that each division would have two brigades in the attack. North to south, it would be the 3rd and 2nd brigades of the 1st Canadian Division, and then the 5th and 4th brigades of the 2nd Canadian Division, a total of about 10 infantry battalions. And with their objective marked off in depth of three stages, the first bound would capture the German frontline trenches, and it was the blue line. And the sec, sorry, that was the first bound. The second bound, the blue line, was on the German second position on the crest of the hill, and a green line was the third and final objective on the lower reverse slope, about 1,500 yards from the start line, a little under one and a half kilometers. The second brigade actually had another intermediate objective called the red line because it had farther to go than everybody else and needed some time to reorganize. The main attack, the 15th of August, 1917. At 4.25 a.m. on the morning of the 15th of August, 1917, the engineers began to fire drums of burning oil into the seat St. Elizabeth, which is a suburb just north of and other selected targets to build up a smoke screen. The 102 18 pounder field guns per division began a creeping barrage, and then four, five, and six inch howers fired what's called a direct to heavy target. The heavy guns and howitzers started blasting any known enemy strong points. While the Germans had detected the Canadians forming up at about 3 a.m., they did not actually begin to fire any defense remit. And it's after being heavily neutral. Using the heavy barrage and thick smoke, the Canadians rapidly advanced, overwhelming the German trench garrison. The more difficult sector was on the right. The second Canadian division's brigades made their way through the ruins of the villages of saint Ouard and St. Saladin, without slowing down, and within 20 minutes from the start of the battle, both the 1st and 2nd Divisions had to their Blue Line objective, covering some 600 yards. After a pause of about 20 minutes, the advance resumed through the village of St. Elizabeth by the 4th Brigade and St. Emile by the 5th Brigade. The 1st Canadian Division's 2nd Brigade had led with its 5th and 10th Battalions to the Blue Line. While they consolidated their gains, they were passed through by the 7th and 8th Battalions and took over. And the brigade took heavy fire from the village of St. Auguste, but it closed. they closed on their red line objective quite rapidly. They halted when they took their 20 minutes and then began the final phase pushing to the green line. But the smoke screen had disappeared and the German defenders were more than aware. And they found by the German fire and a series of, it became a series of rushes from shell hole to shell hole where the Canadians lost their barrage. Only small parties of the Canadians made it to the German lines, but were eventually pushed back to the red line. The 3rd Brigade, Brigade advanced with the 15th, 13th, and 16th battalions through the entire attack. The second phase had the 3rd Brigade meeting little more opposition and taking fire from a place called Bois Hugo, and the 15th battalion took a medium trench mortar with 500 rounds, which they promptly turned on the Bois Hugo and cook fired off 500 rounds to give the Germans a taste of their own medicine. At 6 a.m., the second brigade was on its red line, and within the other sectors, the other brigades were on the green line. While this was all going on, the 4th Canadian Division launched a diversionary attack at Lens itself, helped by 200 more gas bombs projected over the German strong points at the city, the town of Avon, just south of Lens. While the artillery and machine guns not involved at Hill 70 fired into the town itself. This led to much fire coming onto it rather than the main attacking forces. The 11th Canadian Brigade pushed towards the center of Lens in the hope that they might be able to take it from the Germans. But the Germans did not give ground and they were driven back to the outskirts of the city. The Canadians consolidated on the blue line and got their Vickers guns up as planned and were really in place by between 7 and 9 a.m. The Germans launched their attack on four points on their positions. The artillery now overlooked the German lines and fired the guns into the Germans as they assembled for the attack, resulting in huge casualties. Over the day, the Germans moved seven more infantry battalions to reinforce the eight that were already fighting around Hill 70. The attack in the afternoon 
of the 15th of August was four waves of infantry, which were met by a hail of shrapnel and machine gun bullets and were all but annihilated. The attack later in the afternoon from St. August was similarly roughly handled by the Canadians. Late in the afternoon, Brigadier General Loomis, of commander of the 2nd Canadian Brigade, ordered the 10th and 5th battalions to storm the 800 yards to the Green Line that remained in German hands. The attack was delayed from 4 to 6 p.m., and it, as the barrage went in, the infantry Lewis guns made short work of a surprise German counterattack that had been forming up at the exact same place as the Canadians were. The 15th of August, 1917, cost Canada 1,056 kills. 2,432 wounded and lost 39 men as prisoner of war. So uh, the picture on the left is the city of Lens. Uh, it's getting hit by Canadian artillery fire in the warm up to the battle. And the one on the right are Canadian troops. They are uh, from the 2nd Canadian Division. They're in a trench on Hill 70. They're in a bit of a pause. You'll notice that one is looking up in the sky. He's actually scouting for airplanes, according to the official caption. The counterattacks. The 16th of August was quiet, except for some small raids by the Germans, until about 4 p.m., when the 2nd Brigade put in its postponed attack from the day before with the 5th and 10th Battalions, and within an hour, they captured the last of the Green Line. The 5th Battalion ended up running low on ammunition and took heavy casualties, but forcing it back to the Red Line. But the 10th Battalion held on with one of its runners, Private Harry Brown, badly wounded and completing his mission of delivering and dying of his wounds right afterwards. He was awarded his Victoria Cross for his action at this time. That evening, the 1st Canadian Brigade relieved the 3rd Brigade. And on the evening of the 17th, it also took over from the 2nd Brigade. It was during this exact phase that Harry Brown, from the 10th Battalion, performed the actions that would get him to the VC. After the capture of a position, the enemy massed in force and counterattacked. The situation became very critical, all wires being cut and it was of the utmost importance to get word back to his headquarters. This soldier and one other were given messages with the orders to deliver to the same place and at all costs. The other messenger was killed. The Private Brown had his arm shattered, but continued through the intense barrage until he arrived at the close support lines and found an officer. He was so spent that he fell down the dugout steps, but regained consciousness long enough to hand over the message saying, important message. Then he became unconscious and died, in the dressing station a few hours later. His devotion to duty was the highest possible degree imaginable, and his success in delivery of the message undoubtedly saved the position for the time, in, saved the position for the time and prevented many casualties. He is currently commemorated in Noel Le Mines Communal Cemetery. The other Victoria Cross recipient in this part of the battle was Private Michael James O'Rourke of the 7th Canadian Infantry Battalion. During the period of the 15th to the 17th of August at Hill 70, near Lens, Private O'Rourke, who was a stretcher bearer, worked unceasingly for three days and nights, bringing the wounded, dressing them, dressing their injuries, and getting them to water. During the whole of the area which he worked was swept by heavy machine gun and rifle fire, and on several occasions he was knocked down and partially buried by enemy shells. His courage and devotion to duty in carrying out his rescue work, in spite of exhaustion and incessant heavy fire, inspired all ranks and undoubtedly saved many lives. He actually survived the war. So this was a really rough phase with the Germans counterattacking. Um, the top soldier on the top left photo is a Canadian enjoying a parcel from home in one of the pauses of the fighting. Um, that's what the official captions. That looks like a pretty, uh, pretty sparse dugout. The one below is one of the things that the Canadians were known for. A Levin's projector basically was a 30 to 40 pound cylinder of gas that was put into a steel tube and projected over German lines. And so it basically dispersed the gas much more effectively than, say, a cloud. Um, and they were used quite liberally by the Canadians. And they would literally just put them in a trench, line them all up, set them off, and they'd go blasting over the German lines and would it dump a large quantity of gas very, very quickly. Uh, the other photo is wounded coming back from Hill 70 on the second and third days of the battle. And so they're a Canadian Scottish unit. I don't know which one. The caption does not say which one it is. Uh, but you'll notice that they're all in kilts. Uh, interestingly enough, they're not wearing their aprons, which was normal, normally. Um, but they're Canadian, uh, Canadian Scottish unit. So they're probably 
from the uh, 3rd Canadian Brigade because that was the unit that had the most amount of Scottish units attacking in it. All three of its leading battalions were actually Scottish battalions in the attack. <clears throat> A consolidation, 18th to the 20th. The night of the 17th and 18th of August, the Germans made several attempts to capture near a plate trench under the cover of a gas attack. All attempts against the chalk quarry failed and only company of the German Reserve Infantry 55 on loan from the 11th Reserve Division managed to get into the Canadian defenses, but were, but were repulsed in the end. The German troops tried employing flamethrowers and managed to get just before they were being driven out. The, the front line quietened significantly after the final counterattack against the Chalk Quarry. For the Canadian Corps, the following two days largely consisted of consolidation. The front line was drawn back about 300 yards, midway between the original and intermediate and final objectives. The 4th Canadian Division slightly advanced towards its forwards post in the outskirts of Lens and extended its front northward to include the lens berthune Road. Curry wished to further improve the position around Hill 70 and ordered an attack against the German positions along a 3,000-yard 2.7 kilometer front opposite the 2nd and 4th Canadian divisions. It was during this phase that Acting Major Oak Hill Lierno, 2nd Battalion, performed actions on the 18th of August east of the town of Luce. During a determined enemy counterattack on our positions, Major Learmouth, when his company was momentarily surprised, instantly charged and personally disposed of the attackers. Later, under an intense artillery barrage, and mortally wounded, he stood on the parapet of the trench, bombing the enemy, and on several occasions, he actually caught bombs thrown at him and threw them back. When unable to carry on the fight, he still refused to be evacuated and continued giving instructions and invaluable advice, finally handing over all of his duties before he was moved to a hospital where he died. He, too, is commemorated in the Mint Communal Cemetery. So there's two Victoria Cross recipients from Canada from the same battle in the same cemetery. Sergeant Frederick Hobson of the 10th Battalion during a strong enemy counterattack, a Lewis gun in a forward position in the communication trench leading to the enemy lines was buried by a shell and its crew, with the exception of one, was killed. Sergeant Hobson, not trained or qualified as a machine gunner, grasped the importance of the post, rushed from his trench, dug out the gun and got it into action against the enemy, who were now advancing down the trench and across the open ground. A jam caused the gun to stop firing and though wounded, he left the gunner to correct the stoppage, rushed forward to the advancing enemy with bayonet and clubbed rifle, single-handedly held them back until he was killed by enemy fire. By this time, the Lewis gunner, gunner had gotten the machine gun back up and reinforcements came, came up to support and the Germans were beaten off. The value, valor and devotion and to duty displayed by this non-commissioned officer gave the gunner time required to get the gun back into action and save the most serious of situations. Unfortunately, his body was lost and he's commemorated on the Vimy, Canadian Vimy National Memorial. The attack on Lens. The operation was scheduled for the 21st of August, the task being divided between the 6th Canadian Infantry Brigade on the left and the 10th Canadian Infantry Brigade on the right. The attack was to begin at 4.35, but the Germans began shelling the Canadian positions at about 4 a.m. Just before the attack, the left flank of the Canadian Infantry Brigade was counterattacked by German units from the 4th Guards Division and a battalion from the German 220th Division. The forces met between the objectives on each side and fought hand-to-hand -hand and with bayonet. In the, in the melee, the 6th Canadian Infantry Brigade advance was stopped cold and the troops forced back to their start line. Communication between the forward units and brigade headquarters began to break down, and it was not restored because of the German bombardment, making it all but impossible to coordinate any support. On the right flank of the attack, a battalion of the 10th Canadian Infantry Brigade suffered many casualties to German artillery fire while they were assembling, and again was met by massed artillery and machine gun fire near its objective. Only three small parties, the largest not being more than 20, reached their objective. The other two attacking units captured their objectives late in the evening creating a salient in the 4th Canadian Division's line. On the evening of the 21st, three parties went forward to bomb the German positions for the flanks, but were only moderately successful. And the attack on the 22nd of August failed to materialize, 
due to some misunderstandings between the battalion and the battalion. up to remedy the situation and attacking a place called the Green Crassier and a mine complex called Foss St. Louis. Their attack was repulsed, and most of the attackers were killed, wounded, or taken prisoners. The Germans held on to this area until they were finally forced to withdraw in 1918. Company Sergeant Major Robert Hanna of the 29th Battalion on the 21st of August at Hill 70. He met with severe enemy resistance at a heavily protected strong point, which had beaten off three attacks and all the officers in the company had become casualty. This warrant officer, under heavy fire, coolly collected a party, led it against the strong point, rushing through the wire, personally killing four of the Germans, and capturing the position and silencing the machine gun. His courageous action was the, responsible for the capture of one of the most important tactical points in the action. He survived the war and was awarded the Victoria Cross. The attack ends the 23rd to the 25th of August. These final actions were mostly carried out by the 4th Canadian Division, who worked to elite on their, in their line from the earlier attack on Lens. The attack on the 21st by the 50th Infantry Battalion was not a success, success and the follow-on attack on the 22nd failed to start due to some misunderstandings. The attack was then handed over to the 44th Battalion with the aim of encircling Lens on three sides and forcing the Germans to either withdraw or be destroyed. The attack on the 23rd of August began at 3 a.m. when the attackers, keeping up with the barrage and getting into the slag heap, but the company assigned to take the former coal mine came under heavy fire and it took until 8.30 in the morning to get a foothold in the buildings. But it was a back and forth battle with the site changing hands many times throughout the day, ending with in German possession. The 24th of August found the troops on the slag heap completely isolated, and they spent the day fighting off German attacks until the late afternoon when the last of those survivors were overrun. The 44th Canadian Infantry Battalion suffered 257 casualties that day, and the two, the two sites also remained in German hands for the rest of the war. The 25th was a more successful day for Canada when the 50th Battalion again attacked and eliminated the German salient, and then they pushed almost to their final objectives. The 3rd Division had come up to and replaced the 1st and 2nd Division on Hill 70, and while it was not as dominating as Vimy Ridge, the position never fell into the German hands again, and the tactical value was such that it's now believed that it was not attacked during the German final spring offensive because it was so headstrongly held. The last Victoria Cross during the battle was won by Acting Corporal Philip Conwell of the 47th Battalion for actions from the 22nd to the 24th of August, 1917. For most conspicuous bravery and leadership, when in charge of a section in attack, his section had the difficult task of mopping up cellars, craters, and machine gun emplacements. All resistance was overcome successfully and heavily casualties inflicted upon the enemy. In one cellar himself, he bayoneted three enemy and single-handedly attacked seven others in a crater, killing them all. On reaching the objective, a machine gun was holding up the right flank and causing casualties. Corporal Connell rushed forward, entered the emplacement, killed the crew, and brought the machine gun back to Canadian lines. The next day, again, he attacked single-handedly another machine gun emplacement, killing the crew, destroying the gun with explosives. This non-commissioned officer alone killed at least 16 Germans, and during two days of actual fighting, carried on continuously his good work until he was severely wounded, and he survived the war. The interesting story about the Ukrainian to ever win the Victoria Cross, he was born in Ukraine. Uh, he ended up, after the war in Ottawa, he and his friend were on hull and got into a bar fight, of all things, and uh, his friend was jumped by an Austro-Hungarian and his friend, and Phil Conwell jumped in, and in the fight, he killed the Austro-Hungarian, and he calmly waited for the police. And when they showed up, he simply told the police that that was the 58th one he'd killed. The police realized there was something very wrong with him, and his war wounds had ever, never actually healed properly, and he spent eight years in hospital getting better. After that, he got a job as a cleaner at Parliament Hill. And one day, while he was cleaning Prime Minister Mackenzie King's office, Mackenzie King realized and was completely shocked that he was working as a cleaner. From that day forward, Philip Conwell had an odd job in the Prime Minister's office until he retired. This battle was a very expensive battle for Canada. The 1st Canadian Division suffered 3,035 casualties in the fight, 
with 881 being killed. The 2nd Canadian Division lost 2,700 casualties with 760 being killed. And the 4th Division lost 1,400 casualties with 380 being killed. And the Corps itself, from its core troops, artillery and miscellaneous, lost another 105 soldiers. The Germans suffered much worse. For the Germans, they had five divisions, an estimated about 100,000 soldiers um, in those five divisions were badly mauled in the fighting and counterattacks, which also prevented them from replacing badly mauled units up in the Ypres salient, because at the same time as this battle was going on, the British were attacking in the Third Battle of Ypres. So where can you visit? At Hill 70, there's now a memorial. And it's not one of the eight that was given to Canada at the end of the First World War. The battle, the Hill 70 Memorial Park is dedicated to the Canadian Corps that achieved their victory here on this, in August of 1917. And it was completed on October 2nd, 2019. Of the memorial is an obelisk signifying the victory of the Canadian Corps in the battle. In addition to the obelisk, there is a series of walkways dedicated to the six Victoria Cross recipients, as well as plazas dedicated to the regiments and soldiers who figured prominently in this battle. It is a privately organized memorial and is supported by visitor donations. It is an impressive site that has its own app to help with the visit experience. It is truly one of the most beautiful memorial parks I've seen. And because it's a more modern memorial park, there is that interesting um, messaging uh, from the first world war, the modern kind of messaging, but as a ground, it is absolutely spectacular. And beside the, uh, beside the uh, Hill 70 Memorial happens to be Loose British Cemetery. And the graves then made are contained in rows A and B of plot one and row A of plot two. The remainder of the cemetery was formed after the armistice by the concentration of graves from all over the battlefields and small cemeteries over in north and east of the village. There are nearly 3,000 casualties from the First World War and a small number of 1939 to 45 war casualties are commemorated in the site. Of these that are commemorated, two thirds from the First World War are unidentified and there are special memorial, memorials erected to two soldiers from the United Kingdom and two, four from Canada who are known to or believed to be buried among them. The other special memorials from the United Kingdom that were originally buried in other cemeteries whose graves were destroyed by the shell fire in the war. The cemetery covers an area of about 11,000 square, 11, square meters and is enclosed by a rubble wall. Of the 900 identified casualties that are commemorated in this cemetery, 251 are Canadian. The Battle of Hill 70 was a big moment for Curry. It was his first attack as the Canadian Corps commander. And it was one of the first times where he got to exercise some actual input in the way the battle was fought. It was the first of three actions that he did where he actually was given orders and he came up with a better plan or chose not to fight it the way they wanted. At the end of 17, tired of Curry not wanting to fight the battle the way Haig wanted it fought. But Curry had an interesting motto, and it came out of this battle. And his belief was that he would use steel, not flesh. He believed that victories were won with shell, the weight of shell and not the cost in buckets of blood. So I hope you've enjoyed the Battle of Hill 70. I, uh, it's been a fun to present, and it's definitely worth going to see because it gives a whole different of Canada's first world war. Thank you very much, everyone.